Welcome to episode number 70 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile care by promoting high-level, creative husbandry individualized for each reptile. As always, for more information on the show, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you can find Bryce Broom's show, Animals Everywhere, as well as the roast sessions and the roundtable discussions, which I think we'll be recording another one in the next couple of weeks, so you can keep an eye out for that. If you are looking for an Animals at Home podcast shirt or sweater, you can head to animalsathome.ca slash shop or head to animalsathomenetwork.com. You can find links to them both there. And of course, $5 does automatically get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com, who is the sponsor of today's episode. You can find links to them in the description or the show notes. And again, those are affiliate links, which means if you do purchase something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you. All right, let's jump into today's episode. So today I spoke with actually another reptile podcaster. There's very few of us out there, so it was awesome to talk with somebody who is also familiar with being behind the mic. Today I spoke with Anthony Pierleoni. Anthony is the senior director and the vice president of The Turtle Room. He's also one of the hosts of the podcast, as well as a new podcast that he runs with his wife Shannon called Turtley Devoted. In this episode, we discussed Anthony's passion for turtles, the conservation efforts he's working on, as well as the rare species and endangered species he's currently working with. And we also discussed communication within the reptile trade. Obviously, we all know quite often communication, especially online, goes the wrong way. So we discussed how to have conversations with people that don't necessarily agree with you, which I think is a really important conversation to have. We are all trying to move this trade in the right direction, and having those good conversations between keepers is paramount. I do hope you enjoy listening to this conversation, and without anything further, here's my conversation with Anthony. All right. Well, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing this. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm a big fan of your show, so it's exciting to... I feel like I've known you for a long time because I watch all the time or listen all the time, so... Well, I appreciate that, here. and it's yeah. always good to have another podcaster on because you kind of... You, you get what it's like to do this, and it's a little more work than it sometimes comes off as. Right. Absolutely. And uh, there's a little less nerves, but yes. Yeah. I remember when I first started, I was very nervous all the time right. and, and it kind of goes away, but you guys do it live. I, I never would have the guts to do it live. So that I think that just eases the pressure a little bit. Yeah, probably. I don't know. I was more nervous in the beginning when we were, when we weren't live mm-hmm. than I am now. I mean, it's been a long time. We've been doing it for almost eight years, but is that how long? Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't, you know, we do like about once a month, we probably average like over the whole length of the show, probably like eight, seven or eight episodes a year. Mm -hmm. But this year I think we did like, we, we would have done like 17 or something by, by the time we do December show. So, wow. And that being the podcast. Yeah. 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 So you guys were early into that, into the podcast space then. Yeah, I think so. I think we were, but, but at that time it was more like my friend was listening to pod podcasts. I always want to call them podcasts. <laughs> My friend was listen, listening to a lot of podcasts and we were talking a lot about it. And we were like, we should do a reptile one. Cause I didn't know of many, let alone turtle ones, but, but, you know, just a reptile podcast. And we didn't, at that time, I wasn't even listening to any, and I didn't even know of any other reptile podcasts. There were some, uh, some of which are now defunct. The only one I know of that's been around as long as us is the Morelia pythons mm-hmm. radio, I think is the only one. Yeah, they've been around for a while. And yeah, there's a yeah. few others that are still in like the podcasting app if you find them, but they're old. old From back old. then, but then yeah. they haven't been recording since like 2014 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, tell me about how you got into turtles originally. Like where, where was that spark come from? Yeah, it's really weird. I, so I grew up thinking that people went and like caught turtles. It was just like going fishing. Like you would just <laughs> do it for sport. And like, um, I didn't really realize. So I, I grew up, um, we didn't have a lot of money. And I was with my aunt a lot, my mother's sister, who was like a second mother to me. And she would take me to catch turtles all the time because she just happened to live in this like uh, apartment complex where they had a large pond nearby where like people can go and walk their dogs and stuff like that. And um, there were lots of turtles and we would go and catch turtles. And I thought that was just a normal thing. We'd take them back and like put them in a bowl with some gravel (laughs) or some totally, you know, inappropriate the amount of turtles that I probably tortured as a five, six, seven, eight year old. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to sit and ponder about that. It makes me feel kind of bad, but um, that just like being out there on a nice summer day, hearing the bugs, hearing the birds, feeling the sun and 
smelling the pond, even though it's not always pleasant. Like that brings me right back to like that special place where like I feel safe and where I really like enjoy the, the, uh, you know, the, the feel of being there. Um, so started then, um, my aunt, this, this, this is where things take a somber turn. My aunt passed away when I was nine. I don't know if there's like some PTSD thing going on there or what, but around that same time I saw the alligator snapping turtle at the Bronx zoo, Mm -hmm. which changed my life because it opened my eyes to like, there's more, you know, there's different turtles in different parts of the world and, um, more than just what's in your backyard or in this case, my aunt's backyard. So um, always kept turtles, even when I was, you know, growing up and it was, it wasn't cool anymore. And I was, you know, um, going to college and things like that. I always kept turtles as, as pets. And then in college is when it really went um, to the next level because I got a couple alligator snapping turtles for my dorm room. Um, which was That's quite a, it was quite so a pet stupid, <laughs> so stupid, but I mean, you know, they grow really slow actually. And when right. you have small ones, like it takes years for them to, to grow. Um, it was the sort of thing where like, they would let you have like a little bowl with a goldfish, but I was like, no, that's, a, that's, I'm, I'm getting some snapping turtles and I'll just act like I don't have them. And then, mm-hmm. um, kind of, I don't know, acted like a tough guy when the RAs wanted to ask me about it and just don't worry about it. You didn't see anything, that yeah, sort of yeah. thing. And it worked out kind of well, but around that time is when the internet was it, starting to really blow up and you could find anything and um, information at that time, you know, finding other people who were interested in some of the forums and things like that. And then my um, obsession, my lifelong interest turned into an obsession and, and from there it hasn't slowed at all. So you basically been keeping turtles at in some capacity since almost your whole life then. Yeah, yeah, really since about 5 years old, it's never stopped. And you know, in college I bred bearded dragons and we kept le- leopard geckos and snakes and things like that because my my roommate who I actually and best friend who I started the podcast with, John, um he's actually taller than me by the way. Um, and you're very tall, which I learned I am. in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm 6 eight. I used to be 69, but I'm 68. But he um How tall is he then? Yeah, he's he's just a little bit taller. But, oh my god! Um, anyway, uh, we he was into reptiles too, and he would talk about going to like reptile shows, and I didn't even know that was a thing. And that's why we were like bringing different um, experiences to it and interests. And there was a pet store where we went to college, and the the owner kind of befriended us and liked us, and he would come to our basketball games, and um, we would go to his house to watch like UFC fights and like all sorts of silly stuff. But we bonded over the reptiles, and we learned a lot from him. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So, so what about seeing that alligator snapping turtle at the zoo change your perspective about them? Or well, cause I it... loved snapping turtles. Mm. We have snapping turtles here in Connecticut where I grew up and, um, you know, they're awesome. And you'll hear people talk about these, these, um, you know, these, these mythical creatures that are in the ponds around here and, oh, I found one it must've been two feet long. And, oh, this one was 150 pounds and all sorts of wives tales that, that aren't, um, true, but um, it, it always piques your interest and you think that there's these huge monsters out there. And when you're a kid, nine years old, you know, a 45 pound snapping turtle is a monster. Um, and then you see this alligator snapping turtle and that one was over 200 pounds. It was absolutely massive. And and it's interesting now, like to be able to, to make connections and talk to other people and what the internet does. Like i in my adult years now, I've been able to talk to the keeper who used to take care of that turtle that literally changed my life wow. and ask him about it and, you know, when it died and how much it weighed and what he used to feed it and how he cared for it. Like that's stuff that, you know, I never would have imagined being able to do um, as a kid. So mm-hmm. it's, it's cool. The sharing of knowledge and, and stuff like that is, is incredible. Yeah, no, that is, that's pretty amazing. So then as far as just keeping the, the, the turtles, at some point your perspective on them must have shifted because you went from just being somebody who's kind of casually breeding or keeping to being much, much more involved, probably more so. I'm, I'm not even sure if you like using the word hobby because it's kind of a small word for what you're doing. How did that transition I love happen? That. Oh, you love I love that you just said that. Hmm. I love, I just wrote a blog. It hasn't been published yet and I haven't done anything with it, but I just wrote a blog because once in a while I have like a, a light bulb moment And I think it was Sunday, I was sitting on the couch and thinking, you know, how, and I I had been listening to, 
it may have been one of your podcasts, mm. but it was it was someone, I don't remember which one because I watched them all out of order or listened to them all out of order, but somebody kept using the word hobby, hobby, hobby. And I was thinking to myself, you know, it's not, I don't see it as a hobby any more than someone who who is, you know, trying to fight injustices, social injustices, or, or who's trying to save, uh, you know, children from, from poverty or hunger, or, you know, any type of really important work. To me, this is the most important thing in the world. Obviously, it's my thing and it's what I care about. It's the reason I have two beautiful daughters and a beautiful wife and a wonderful job and a wonderful home. But I get out of bed in the morning because of turtles. Mm -hmm. And and it's just the way it is. It's what really gets me going. And and um, I don't see it as a hobby because, and this is where I, I listen to a lot of reptile podcasts. And this is where I think turtles take it to a different level um, a frog people might say the same thing because they're obviously really endangered as well. But when the animal that you choose to work with, when the, when the vast majority of them are, uh, um, of conservation concern, then I think that's an added wrinkle beyond, um, just animal welfare and, and how well are you keeping them? But, you know, you can have, a spider tortoise, for instance, I just saw someone post online that they wanted a spider tortoise, which is a, a species from Madagascar. It's really beautiful and sought after and they stay small. So everybody wants them. And somebody just said, I'm looking for one spider tortoise. I don't need a group. I don't need whatever. I just want to have one spider tortoise as a pet. And they don't think they're saying anything wrong. But when I see that, I'm like, mm. and and they, they weren't necessarily doing anything wrong. It's just like a, a little bit of ignorance and not knowing. And that's fine because we're all ignorant in our own way. And, and we're all learning every single day. But there's certain things that kind of strike a chord with you. Um, yeah. And I just think, you know, that's a, a real shame. And I think anyone who wants to keep turtles in general, but, but specific species, of course, um, ought to be thinking about conservation or, or using, using the animal in some way, whether it's education or, or something to make the world a better place for turtles, because mm -hmm. we chose them. And that's why a lot of these species are endangered is because of us. And um, we're in a lot of cases, pretty much every case, the only way that they're going to, you know, recover for, from what we've done. So is it mostly habitat or habitat loss that's damaging the the populations? It's everything. There, you know, it's funny. Um, the the zoology book that was taught to students from like 1950s to the 70s compares turtles to cockroaches, basically. Wow. Where I think they might it might actually compare them the two, but it basically says like turtles have been around forever. They've been around virtually unchanged for 200 million years. They've been, you know, I tell my kids all the time and they don't know what I'm talking about yet, but like turtles have been around since long before T-Rex and hasn't really changed. They just happen to still be here. Um, and, and they're going to live on long before, well, I'm sorry, long after we're gone. And that's mm -hmm. basically what the zoology textbook from the seventies says, how fast that can switch to now our existence in almost every way threatens their survival. So it's, it's habitat loss is huge. Um, it's, it's moving animals around certain species like the Reeves turtle, which there's 10 million Reeves turtles produced in China every year, but it's still an endangered species. And a lot of the Reeves turtles that are in the wild have been moved around different like temple ponds and things like that. So genetic diversity, um, you know, becomes really muddied in that situation. Um, and it's collection for the pet trade, uh, traditional medicine. So there, there are species that, you know, it's, it's thought that if you consume their eggs, that you're going to be, uh, more fertile or, or, uh, have more stamina in the bedroom. Um, there's animals that, you know, they grind up the plastra, the, the, the bottom of the shell into a powder, um, and that's used to fight cancer. And it's believed that, you know, if you get one from the wild, that it's much more potent. So you want that, you know, that, that natural wild caught animal, because it's going to 
do better for you than the one that came from the farm that might not be uh, genetically as pure as something that came out of, out of the wild. So there's a lot of um, really scary um, thought processes around these species uh, around the globe. And every animal has its own unique, complicated challenges that um, as an educator or as a breeder, we need to do our best to learn and, and try to teach others. Yeah, there's definitely a heavier streak that runs through keeping turtles that you don't see in all the sides of the reptile trade is, you know, w- mm-hmm. with, with that endangered species. So as far as the, the pet trade goes, the turtles are also one of those areas where there's, I don't know if there's too many turtles, like there's lots of really bad care happening with turtles. I, you know, I've spoken oh, sure. to people who have turtle rescues and whatnot. I'm sure you experience this all the time. They're just completely full and people get these, it's almost like they live for such a long time and they can almost live through like any horrible condition for like 30 years. Yeah. So we have all of these, it's almost like a plague through the hobby as well. So as far as the hobby itself goes, as far as, you know, the average person caring for a turtle, what are some of the issues that we have there? Um, I think I think one of the main issues is that people just don't keep the right species. So mm-hmm. in America, we have the four-inch law, which is a federal law that um, came into play in the 70s um, because kids were putting small turtles in their mouth. Oh, um, but that law, I mean, you know, eat dog poop, eat lettuce from Chipotle, like put the back end of a bearded dragon in your mouth. Like it's all stupid and it all can cause you a lot of harm. Um, but so, so the thought being if a four inch turtle is sold, then kids can't put it in their mouth because that was something that happened. Um, what people don't realize, I was just listening to a different podcast today that talked about the best pet species to keep um, for, you know, for all reptiles, but um, turtles in particular. And the one that always comes up is um, Russian tortoises because they're smaller. Russian tortoises are still a large species. If you, if you see a big female Russian tortoise, like, you know, they're, they're big. Um, and those are taken from overseas. So that's a wild animal that's taken from, uh, you know, the Mediterranean taken, um, out of the wild, um, for a, from Asia, um, taken out of the wild, put in a crate shipped here, and then put for sale at Petco and PetSmart. Mm -hmm. And people have them walking around their house. Like that's a big issue. That's a health issue for the people. And it's a health issue for the animal. Um, I think the anthropomorphizing is, is not good for the animal um, either. And then on the turtle side with the aquatics, you see the red ear sliders and other large species because those are what makes sense for the people who are selling the turtles. They can raise them to four inches to abide by that law really quickly and cheaply. And that's mm-hmm. why it's the species that you're getting. It's not because it's what's best for you as a pet. Right. So with knowledge comes the ability to say, okay, if I go online and I actually research I can get a male map turtle. I can get a male Reeves turtle. I can get a Southern painted turtle, something that really could be a great pet as opposed to these turtles that get so large that now you're dealing with green smelly water and the turtle's not healthy and you're not healthy potentially because of that. So it's tough. And, you know, there's ways around it in this, in the States, there are people where you can, you know, hobbyists where you can buy, um, smaller turtles under four inches, but it's, um, you know, a a lot of people I think don't realize what's actually going on with those Russian tortoises. I wouldn't call them a beginner. I don't think taking a wild animal from across the world and putting it into your apartment is a beginner situation. Yeah. No, I totally agree. And so do you think that the trade itself is overpopulated with the wrong species in general? Because I, you know, yeah. even like something like sulcatas, I see people, I don't, and I don't know really much about the sulcata market at all, but anytime I see someone produce a, a big clutch of them, I always wonder what is going to happen to those little tortoises. Yeah. There's good and bad with sulcatas. Um, sulcatas are endangered. They're, mm-hmm. they're, you know, um, eaten in, in the, uh, bush meat trade in, in Africa and, um, they're an endangered species, but you'll never have to import another sulcata again right? Um, or smuggle one or anything like that. So that's like the Tom Crutchfield idea of um, conservation through commercialization. I don't totally sign on with that, but it's one positive. Beyond that now, it's too much. Um, but, you know, we used to vend at the Hamburg Reptile Show for years and do some educational stuff. And then Chris Leone, our partner from uh, Garden State Tortoise, would be selling tortoises. And, you know, he would be trying to sell uh, a marginated tortoise or a Herman's tortoise for like $80. 
but another table would have the sulcatas for $60 and they would sell like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. It's a cute hatchling. And these are people who know a little bit better. And you try to say to them, you know, well, I'm thinking about a sulcata or I'm thinking about this. You want this, you know, this is great. This can live outside here year round. This is what you want. And I say, yeah, but I'm going to have a bigger house in the future. So it'll be fine. Or my, you know, when it gets larger, it can go live at my mom's place or whatever. And I'm like, how many people, I kept sulcatas in college and I'm in college. Like I'm, I'm going to make a life for myself and I'm going to move South and I'm going to have a bigger house and I'm going to have a separate building for my sulcatas and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and it's just like, you know, it's, it's like lying to yourself that you're going to have all these things lined up so you can keep this animal when the right answer is just a table away for $20 more or $10 more, or who cares how much more, like, you know, get the right animal for you and your situation. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is definitely an interesting situation, especially with the fact that their lifespans of almost all these species is just ridiculous compared to, you know, it's not a 15 year bearded dragon or whatever you're, you're you're really committing to decades. It can be, you are, if you do it right. I think, you know, the, 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 the sulcata is going to live forever. Well, it can, but I think more often than not, they, you know, animals don't, turtles don't because they're not, you know, kept the right way. I could even tell you, I could look at my list. I keep, we have a, a database that um, Steve, the uh, the founder of, of the turtle room, who's my partner and, and has been my closest partner for years and years um, that he created with Kevin Labile, who has his doctorate in like computer programming stuff he's they're so smart and they built an actual database which is like better than what the zoos use that we use we have a version for us and then there's also a version that people could use for free for up to 25 of their animals for data for for um keeping data Uh, it's for turtles though but you know you pick the species every species that exists is in there you pick the species you put in the information the measurements all of that you could print out spreadsheets it's really incredible um but if you look at you know, that data for the animals that I keep, for instance, like my collection has changed a ton over the years and animals die sometimes. And, you know, when you're trying to set up breeding groups, sometimes animals move around a little bit and um, things have changed a lot for me over the past 12 years. So, Mm -hmm. Um, and I like to think that I'm really dedicated, but I'm just, you know, being honest that I think things change. And if you ask most, if, if you really took a real look at most people's collections, that things, you know, people seem to, if you're looking at the snapshot over time, change their mind more than they change their underwear. But yeah. And that's, and that's true even with the reptile side as well. People that keep snakes and and lizards is kind of a revolving door. So as, as far as the turtle room goes, tell me a little bit about how that started. I know you were talking about the founder and then how did you get involved in sort of what is it? Yeah. So, well, Steve and I, it was really funny. So Steve was, Steve and I were talking about it and we were kind of building it together. Um, what his ideas were and everything. And he's like, all right, I'm making this thing and I want you to be a part of it. And the dues to be a part of it are $50. I'm like, no, man, I'm not paying you $50 to be a part of the turtle club. So (laughs) a few months passed and he ended up being like, okay, finally, like you don't have to pay the $50 to be a part. Like you're doing other things. So like, of course I am because I, you know, care about you and what you're doing, but I'm not paying you $50 for that. At that time, $50 was a real lot of money for me. Yeah. Um, so, uh, he basically made the website and, and, you know, started to create everything, which was totally different than what it is today. So he's the founder. Um, but we've been right there together from before it even existed. I'm really proud of that. And it's, it really just started off as, Hey, we are, you know, college educated people. We didn't go to school for biology or zoology. And we feel kind of crummy about that because we feel like we can't make a difference. We're on the forums with people who are out there in the field doing really cool stuff. And here we are, you know, with our animals and feeling like we want to do more and be a part of more and not just have it be social, but, and not just have it be just a hobby, but actually try to do something with this. Mm. And that was kind of how we built it. And we said, we're going to treat everyone the right way. We're going to collaborate with people and not make anyone feel like they're not, you know, like their voice shouldn't be heard or, or they shouldn't be involved or whatever. If somebody has a talent or a ability or the desire, then we're going to try to find a way to get them involved. And fast forward to now, and the turtle room has, you know, like 
25 volunteers from around the world and we're doing some really, really cool work. Um, both, well, so the, the tagline is education, conservation, survival, and that kind of touches on our three headed approach to, um, to helping turtles. And, um, the first education is, um, something that I oversee and that's basically, you know, in-person education, um, the developing, uh, media that can be consumed. We used to do a lot of YouTube videos, which we do, don't anymore, but we have the podcast that's under the Turtle Rooms umbrella. Um, our new po podcast, Turtly Devoted, is as well. We have a, a team of writers who write blogs for us um, and uh, species profiles and things for the website. Um, for the conservation, we have in situ work, which we're actually doing. We have um, a project in Pennsylvania where we're um, studying wood turtles and other species um, to see kind of how they're using the habitat and um, keeping track of the population in several different sites now. And then we also have work with the Diamondback Terrapin in, in New Jersey, um, the Terrapin Conservation Initiative, which is really cool. So actually getting out there and doing real work. And we have like a biologist on our team now, um, Andy Weber, who's incredible. And, um, you know, he, he wants to keep building his resume doing turtle stuff. So it's all volunteer based. Nobody is paid at this point. Um, it's just people who are doing what they love because they think it's important. And then for the survival stuff, um, the last part of the three word tagline is more our assurance colonies, animals that we actually have in captivity that are spread throughout our members that are either owned by the turtle room or by us individually. Um, animals in the species survival programs with the AZA and stuff like that. So we work really hard to try to keep diverse um, groups of animals and, and keep and breed them in a way that can actually make a difference, which is very difficult. The education, I just want to say the education portion of that is the easiest. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do it. My coach used to say, anyone can be a leader. Even if you're a freshman and the season hasn't even started yet, you never played a college game in your life. You can be a leader when something, when adversity strikes and you're there with your teammates or with someone who needs help or whatever, you can step up and act like a leader no matter who you are. And, and that's kind of how education is, right? My six-year-old teaches my four-year-old all the time. Mm -hmm. She's a teacher and that's a really important thing for her own growth. And I think no matter who you are, you can help teach others, but to do it in a way that isn't like matter of fact. And I think semantics and, and, and your approach to things are really important. So very long-winded answer to your question. No, no, that's good. Because it, it is very interesting. Like, I, I love the fact that you're sitting there thinking we want to make a difference and we don't have these credentials that are so-called you need to make a difference. And and I'm kind of in the same boat. I don't, I have a degree in anthropology. It's nothing to do with biology. And and you can actually make a difference. It's, 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 yeah. you know, and, and so many people are in the same thing. They, they don't have a degree and they, they want to, you know, make a difference in animals' lives. There is a way to do it. You just have to play differently than, than the person that's going through the university. So that, for one, is, is so fantastic. And as, as far as the, the research is going, you have, you know, you were saying different pockets of research happening. So is, are those just volunteers that are, you know, creating studies or how, how does that work? Yeah, it's volunteers. But then, so, so when I send an email out, and this is what I love from the beginning when we did the Turtle Room, like I could have the logo and like, you know, assistant director at one point, senior director, vice president, like, you know, over the years as things have kind of developed and everything. Um, and and it, it puts a, a bit of clout behind what you're doing, which is really cool. I think, I think everyone should have a brand who can and, and, you know, brand what you're doing, collaborate with other people, try to build something more, put, make what you're doing sound important because it is animals are important. People care about animals. And if you're going to put your time and energy and resources into something, then do it to the best of your ability. And, and yeah, just, just brand it and get out there. And, and what that does is it adds more clout. So when we want to have a study site in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, we have the turtle rooms name behind that. Um, for the one in Pennsylvania, we collaborated with the turtle survival Alliance which is the biggest global player in turtle conservation and, and a great partner of ours and, and someone who we're very, very proud to work with. And um, they, they um, help with, helped us with the permit process and starting it up, but they're very happy to let us run with it and, and run the project because that's something that, um, that they don't have the capacity to do. 
Um, and we're happy to, and we have people like Andy, who's leading that, who again, is it, he's a biologist and he works as a biologist, but he doesn't do enough turtle work and he wants to build his resume and he wants to be a turtle biologist. So now he is a turtle biologist for a real nonprofit. And, you know, the next time he applies for a job, he'll have the work that pays the bills plus the turtle room work on his resume so that he can take that next step. It's a beautiful thing. Actually, I was a social worker. It was something that I kind of fell into. And, and I was pretty good at it because I like to think I have good people skills and that sort of thing. But I, I did get burnt out and, and was looking for a change. And um, I was hired in the veterinary field. And I, I run a veterinary hospital now. I'm the hospital manager. So I'm like the, the, the leader of the hospital, which is incredible. And, and I love it. And I get to work with doctors and, and learn about the veterinary field at a level that I never thought I would. And that's because of the turtle room. I was a social worker who had people skills, but then I was an animal person because of, excuse me, because of the turtle room. And I then apply and that's on my resume. And now I get to run an animal hospital. Like how cool is that? So um, it all trans, you know, transfers over and, and kind of that's what it provides for us. And and that's how the um, institute projects work anyway, how we got them set up. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's so true. When you put effort into something that is for a good cause, it eventually pays off. Like you're not going to yeah. get rich off the turtle room, but it, it pays, it, it sends you down a different path that allows you to get this other job. And I think that's in so many ways, that is exactly how th- things pay off when you do them well. Right. In sure. ways that you might, might not have expected either. Right. Yeah. You never know. I never would have guessed that this would have been my path, but I'm really proud of it. And um, it just shows kind of where you could end up um, if you just keep plugging away at it every day. You don't know what's going to turn into something really big, um, but things just kind of come up. So. So, so as far as the assurance uh, colonies go, I guess I'm sure I know obviously you have quite a collection at home and I'm, I'm guessing there's a few of a few people in the turtle room that have some similar capacities. So what are you keeping right now? And what are some of the animals that that you have that are endangered? So I probably, I specialize most in Asian turtles, but, but everything I have is exotic. So, you know, the United States really are just a group of different States with their different legislation and stuff. And, and, you know, like Chris Leone, who is garden state tortoise, my partner um, in and, and our director of animal husbandry in New Jersey, they have laws that really make sense. Like you can't take stuff out of the wild. You can have native, but you have to have them on a permit. They know who everyone is. They know who the players are. They know who has what. And as long as you're abiding by the law and working with them, then you can have some stuff. Connecticut doesn't have any manpower on, on in terms of our fish and wildlife. It's called um, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, they basically say we're going to outlaw pretty much everything and then we're not going to have to look at anything. So, so it's kind of like gun control, like there's laws, but, and and not to get political or whatever, but there, you know, it doesn't really take the turtles out of the hands of the bad guy. It just means Mm -hmm. that it makes it really complicated for me to make anything happen because there's no one I can call there and talk to. And, and it's, it's difficult. So, so I just decided at one point, like I'm just going to specialize in exotic stuff and I have a lot of Asian turtles. Um, so I keep a lot of, uh, Cora, which those are the, um, Asian box turtles, uh, really probably one of the, it's gotta be one of, if not, it's probably the rarest genus in terms of like how endangered they are. Um, there's, yeah. Um, the, the vast majority, like all but one are endangered and that one is vulnerable and should be listed as, endangered probably there's uh, they're very endangered and then um uh asian pond turtles as well of the genus maremis so that's like your quang tongue river turtle which is extinct in the wild or the reeves turtle which is endangered um things like that and then um uh, some tortoises too spider tortoises egyptian tortoises star tortoises pancake tortoises um quite a few of those um yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's probably, I, I think I keep around 40 different species or different taxa and about two, 200 um, animals here. Yeah, that's a, that's a big job. It's a lot. It's a, it's a lot. It's, it's, I'm basically like, I, so I work, but I, I wake up early in the morning and go and take care of the animals and then I'm off to work and then I come home to take care of the animals. So that was my day today. Animals work, animals podcast. Yeah. It's a full, a full slate. Yeah. 
Well, and you know, I was talking about this last week on, on an episode that I recorded it and you've taken it to another level, but the idea of when you have several animals, it, I think it's important that people have goals with what they're doing with their animals, mm-hmm. it, especially if you're, if you I mean, if you have one bearded dragon or something, it doesn't matter. But if you are someone that's starting to collect a collection of animals, having some kind of goal, and maybe it's not conservation related, maybe it's just having really good care. So when random people come over, they get to experience these animals in a cool natural habitat or something. But having a direction with what you're doing with the animals is so important or else you end up, you know, you might have a bunch of animals that you don't even want at the end of the day. I still struggle with it. Mm-hmm. I still do. So, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and act like I don't, that like I'm not a, a person who doesn't like to keep animals in captivity. There's probably a reason why I gravitate more towards turtles because the more I learned about them, because I, I mentioned before we, we, I'm not sure if I'm, no, it was when we were live or recording. Um, that I had bred bearded dragons and kept some other stuff in college and things like that. And um, probably the reason why I kept going towards turtles was that I knew they needed it. They needed help. And I love the fact that it needs to be bred. Like I don't want to keep a sulcata and know like, Oh, I don't get to hatch eggs. Hatching, uh, hatching an egg of anything is my favorite thing in the world. It's Mm -hmm. nothing makes me happier than seeing that, that little life pop out of that egg and take its first breath or take its first look around. Like that is the coolest thing in the world to me. And, and I'm proud to be a turtle person because I don't think it, and this is my, my opinion. So if you disagree, that's totally fine. Um, but I don't think it's, it's as important anywhere as with turtles. And that's probably just my own bias, but, um, I like knowing that I need to breed this, not just because I enjoy doing it just as, just like a ball Python breeder likes seeing or Royal Python breeder likes seeing, you know, one of them pop out of the egg. Um, it takes it just a step further when you know it's needed. It's not just because someone's going to buy it. It's because Mm. there needs to be more of this species in the world. And even if it's not going to be returned to the wild, it, you know, reduces the risk or need for them to be imported. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you know, it's so true. I mean, years ago I wanted to breed boas, but I came to a point where I realized there was no need to have yeah. more boas here. There's already yeah. plenty. Yeah. People are buying them. I don't need to bring in, you know, 40 more animals into the world just because I want to do it. But And I get the total interest and exciting piece of breeding and getting to, you know, create life is so exciting. But if you can attach a, a deeper purpose to it, it, it is really crucial. Right. And that's why I'm here. And But that's also why I don't have sulcatas anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, African spurthide tortoises for anyone who doesn't know what sulcata means. Yeah. Yeah. Big tortoise. Yeah. Big tortoise. Third largest species in the world, over 300 pounds for um, the Sudanese locale. Yeah. So really Massive. large tortoises. Yeah. And they're cool, amazing tortoises, but yeah. You yeah. They're have awesome. A special spot. Yeah. <laughs> a special and I, and I have a lot of respect for people who like rescue sulcatas and give them a great life. But in the space where I can keep two sulcatas, I can keep a whole herd of something else. Mm -hmm. Um, In the space where I could keep, um, you know, some rescue readier sliders, I can keep, you know, 40 Vietnamese black-breasted leaf turtles. Right. That's why I reached out to you again after we had talked months ago. There were two... There were two mentions of the Vietnamese black breasted yeah. leaf turtle in in back to back episodes of yours, and I said, "Oh man, that's a sign. I need to talk to." Dan yeah, again. no, I'm glad you did. You you were still on my list, but I just have this growing list of people. And of so, course, that's yeah, a good no, thing. Yeah, no, it was great, and uh, and so it was, we were calling your name with that, and you, I, I didn't even realize you 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 wrote the book on them. I did. I wrote a book. There's also a German book on them, but yeah, I wrote so, the English version, the English uh, uh, language version. So tell me about that. How did, how did that fall into your lap or how did you get motivated to do that? Um, you know, it's really, all right, this is going to sound silly because writing that book was probably my biggest accomplishment my entire life. But the actually writing a book about a genus like that, because I wrote it on the Japanese version as well, um, the G- Geomita japonica, which is in the Ryukus, which is like Japan's version of Hawaii. Like mm-hmm. it's part of it, but it's a totally different culture and, and is, is far from the mainland. Um, and they have a Japanese version of the black breasted leaf turtle. And then there's um, the Spangler eye, 
the Vietnamese black breasted leaf turtles from, which is from Vietnam and, and Southern China. And, um, you know, when you're excited about keeping a rare animal and you're researching, you want to read whatever you can, especially with some of these rare species, there's not a lot written, right? Right. So you take something like a red ear slider or a ball python, there's so much, so much. You could spend your whole life trying to read everything that was written and you'd never catch up because someone's going to write something new. With some of these rare species, like you're trying to read like old forum posts from 2004 where some people were just talking about them. Mm -hmm. And that's important information. Like that's how little there is on, on some species. So basically I read everything there was on them three times. And I was breeding Spangler eye and my partner was breeding Japonica. And I said, let's put our information together. Let's take all this information that I've read, which is, which is a lot, but really it's nothing and arrange it all in a, in an outline and see if I can get a book written. And I started talking to Russ Gurley, who um, has published probably, I don't even know how many books he's written, like 15 books on, on turtles and invertebrates and, and reptiles other reptiles as well. And he has living art publishing. And I went to him and I just said, you know, I'd be interested in, in writing this if you ever would, would be interested in publishing it. And he said, I've been trying to write that book for like 12 years and I've had people who said they would write it, but they're, they haven't, they haven't followed through. I'm like, I'll send you like, I'll have it done for you in like two weeks. Like just I'll send you a rough draft, a really rough draft. But um, I wrote it really quickly because I was just so excited. And basically it's like, you know, a 30 page word document. And then you add all of the maps and graphs and data um, images, and then all of the photos. And now you have like a 120 page book. Right. So, so that it, it really wasn't that much. It was just the right, the right taxa um, at, at the right time with the right publisher and um, everything kind of worked out, but, but a great first book. And I've been writing still, and I have a couple books I've been working on, but um, bigger ideas and, and haven't been able to cross the finish line as easily. But mm -hmm. I think having young kids and changing careers and having a growing collection all takes its toll on that as well. Yeah, I've actually started to work on a, a book as well. And it's amazing how it's on my list to do every day. And then every day I don't do it. <laughs> right. Next thing I know, it's like, it's been two months and I haven't touched that. It's been yeah. six months and I haven't touched that. And that's not what I anticipated. And that's certainly not what the first book was like, because it was something, if I'm not putting my thoughts into this right now in the book form, then I'm going to be on a forum or a Facebook group talking about it anyway. Exactly. With, you know what I mean? And like getting frustrated by different comments and stuff like that. So let me just focus. And, um, that was, so that's why that was probably my crowning achievement personally is, is being able to actually focus all of these big ideas and turn one of them into something. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. Yeah. And I actually wanted to jump back to something that you'd said earlier. And, and I totally sure. agree that there, if you keep animals at home, there is a certain amount of selfishness that comes along with that, that I think some yeah. people aren't really willing to admit. And you have to, you have to admit that, that totally. there's absolutely it's a privilege to keep these animals and yeah. it's, it, there, it is driving from a, a want to be able to wake up and see them every day. And it's not something that you necessarily have to do, yeah. but I think that's an important thing to admit to yeah. carry on the, whatever you're doing with more power. You mentioned that all the time that it's a privilege and not a right. I, I would, with turtles, I would take it a step further and, and it's not only is it a privilege, but it's, it's like a, a duty. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I was trying to touch on a little bit before you choose them. And they're in this horrible situation because of what, tur what, sorry, what humans have done to the turtles. And, and so now it's, it's a duty to do things the right way. Yeah. Like, you know, if you just want to make a buck and, and, you know, pull the wool over someone's eyes on Craigslist and flip animals or flip whatever, like, I just don't think it, and maybe again, that's me just on my soapbox and, and, and being frust uh, frustrated, you know, aging turtle guy, but, um, I, I don't know. It's just, I think that there's more there. Like, like we just ought to be better. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. But then I also think there's a way to do it because I listen to all these podcasts and it's, and, and yours is, is great. I think it's great to, to challenge people to be better keepers. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important, but at the same time, I think the way that you do that is really important. And I think a lot of people miss the mark and, but not just because of their shortcomings, but because it's animals, people get really fiery about animals, whether you're 
an animal rights activist with PETA or you're a keeper or, or whatever, or you're a person visiting the zoo, people just get really rabid pun intended Mm -hmm. from animals. And um, I think, you know, semantics and the way that you phrase something or approach something could be the difference between causing a divide between people that both want what's best for the animal or bringing people together so that we can actually build a community that works together, respects each other. You know, we all started somewhere um, and, and, you know, social media makes for a really ugly communication, whether yes. it's animals or otherwise. And I think it's so important that, you know, we find a way, especially the leaders in the field, um, which I think both of us are, we both have a platform. Mm-hmm. I'm not, obviously we look at other people who we look up to and say, oh my gosh, like I'm not on that level, but we are on a level. We're sitting here having a conversation that people will listen to. Yeah. And I think for that reason, we need to hold ourselves, um, to, you know, approaching things in a way that is always approachable and a- attractive to people who are trying to learn. Because if you don't give it to them, they'll get it from somebody else who's going to be more inviting yes. than we are, you know? So that's just a thought that I had. And then I also think perspective is everything too. So um, you had some guests on who were talking about Clint and they were saying they didn't like yes. his his show, but they loved Kenan. And I thought that's so funny as a turtle person because a lot of the really, really hardcore, obsessive, been in it for 40 years, turtle people really don't like Kenan because he doesn't have a ton of substance from their perspective, but he's he's very flashy and, and um, definitely has the showmanship that you need to really build a big channel. And I think there's jealousy there as well. Mm-hmm. But when I heard Clint on... Um, searchable as reptiles, I thought, wow, this guy, but that's my own turtle background. I'm listening to a guy who's not just a turtle guy. And I think, oh, he sounds, he sounds good. I bet you he's really good for education. He's smart. So I think per- perception is everything. Um, and not to say anything bad about Ken. And I think the work that he does is incredible. And I think it's important, you know, and he's not perfect and Clint's not perfect and you're not perfect and yeah. I'm not perfect. So I think, to, to throw shade at somebody or to say, well, they did this and this, so they're not cool. You know, Clint said, put ball pythons in Iraq. Well, a lot of people keep and have put ball pythons in Iraq and just saying research shows that's wrong. It's, that's not going to attract people as much as, you know, let's talk about it a little more mm-hmm. and um, talk about pros and cons. And I know that people are probably rolling their eyes at that, but I, I think, you know, um, kind of wording something as like, instead of saying that can't be good for the animal, say like, you know, I wonder about the welfare of the animal and would be interested in like, you know, having more of a conversation about that. I think it, I think it's tough because we've, we've, we're obsessed with it. It involves animals and we know what we're talking about. So we get down this path of kind of throwing shade, but it was just a thought that I had and, and nothing against anybody involved. I just think it's what we do as humans. It, it, totally. Yeah. There, there is a way to present information to somebody who disagrees with you in a way that they'll yeah. be receptive to it. And there's, yeah. and then, but for humans, most, most of the time, the instinct is to not present it in that way. It's to present yeah. it in the way that also is going to, you know, get the knife in and twist it a little bit, yeah. which at the end of the day, doesn't help the animal, which we're trying to help. So it, it, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's exactly how you present the information, how you open up dialogue with somebody. Yeah. You can't start with the attack. It just doesn't work. And it, yeah. As soon as you do that, you, they throw up a wall yeah. and, and that's it. And I've done it myself recently um, where I had a disagreement with somebody because I was being snarky on, on a public post. And afterwards we're talking about it. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll own it. I was. And it was just like me being sucked into the social media trap that mm-hmm. nobody set, but just, it's just there. It's something about having a, a public conversation with somebody and you're not face to face and you're just reading the text. So you can't, you can't, you know, discern what their tone or volume was or what, what their, you know, what their angle is. Cause they just came out of nowhere. Like you have no idea. And sometimes you take a little bit of offense and you come back with a snarky remark and then it, you know, no, nobody's gaining anything from that. So yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. I, I, I don't comment on almost anything on social media just because I mean, I, yeah. I've, I've did it years ago and you end up just getting pissed for the rest of the right. day. <laughs> so I just right. stopped that completely. There's just no point. Right. Have you read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? 
I have not read it. No, I'm obviously familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, that book I always encourage everybody to go read because it's really yeah. easy read, and but it does really teach people how to present ideas and have conversations with people yeah. that. And if you're trying to sway ideas, it's yeah. it's really crucial. Like you said, you can't yeah. make fun of people for something that they're doing yeah. and expect them to listen to you after. That's one of the reasons why I'm in the not that book, but but that idea is one of the reasons why I'm in the veterinary field because they, they asked me in my interview, like, how do you do with, you know, difficult people? Like, I deal on a daily basis all day long with the most difficult people society has to offer. I'm a social worker. I work mm-hmm. with the folks um, who are in the most need of services and support. And, you know, uh, dealing with an angry customer at a veterinary hospital is nothing. Like, yeah. it, and they're a touch of crazy, even better. Let's do it. Um but you know, doctors and and people in the in the animal world in general, and and veterinarians and and even technicians. So one of the things that I've been able to do with with VCA, um, which is the company I work for, is uh, we also have uh, hospitals in Canada as well, VCA Canada. Yeah, actually, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But um, so one of the things I've been able to do is to be a trainer of new hires throughout the entire Northeast of the United States. And um, basically training them on the VCA way, teaching them about the company and all that sort of stuff, but also um, training them on communication techniques, Mm -hmm. um, how to, you know, and basically just that idea. And I can't tell you how many people I'll ask them every time, you know, why'd you get into this field? And so many people say, it's so funny because it's such a random question, like, like broad question that you can answer in any way. But so many times people say, I got into this because I love animals more than people. Yeah. And I think Dylan, you would agree. And I would agree both of us that we love animals more than people in general. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but you're in for a rude awakening when you work in the veterinary field and you're not a people person and you don't want to deal with that nonsense. It is nonsense, but you have to be able to play the game and do it well and, and win, win people over or, or show them that you care a little bit. Otherwise it doesn't matter what you say. So exactly. 55% of first impressions are based off of visuals. Um, some, some other percentage, I, I don't know if this is going to add up to um, a hundred or not, but something like 16% of that is based on tone or volume or no, maybe that's 30. It's 30 something. And then 7% is based on what you actually say. Such a small point. It doesn't matter. And that's why we can't remember yes. people's names when we meet them mm-hmm. because your the first impression is being made off of how that person makes you feel, the Maya Angelou quote. Um, so I just, I think it's really interesting that people, you know, you think, well, if I learn a little bit more about this obscure species that nobody gives a hell about, mm-hmm. believe me, that I'll be more respected or whatever. No, the way you approach people and the way you collaborate and and what you're willing to do will go a lot further. Yeah. And, and those things, those items that you just said get totally stripped away on social media. So you're just completely removing that ability to re- read tone and, and visualize somebody. So yeah. all of that gets, so that's, you know, you get sent down a horrible rat hole and, you know, yeah. you have people all the time that are like, I don't like people. I like animals more. So I'm going to get into breeding snakes. And yeah, like, are right. you going to sell snakes to other snakes or are you going to sell snakes <laughs> to people and, <laughs> right. and have a customer base and have to constantly deal with people? Because and sure. it's true. You can't, you don't get to just completely recluse away and just be surrounded by animals. Right. That's not how the world works, unfortunately. No. And especially if you want to save animals, then mm-hmm. now you have to convince people who are on the other side of the aisle who have different interests than you. And that's why it's so important to b- try to bring people together. You can't say, hey, man, you're dumb. I know what's right. Let's save these animals. Like, no, how are you going to tell me that? I have to feed my family or I have to build this new housing complex or I have to do whatever I have to do. Get yeah. these animals out of my way. I don't care if I bulldoze you know, a, a habitat for a turtle or a frog or, or a newt. I don't, I don't care. Yeah. So, you know, how do you get that person to understand and, and to care? Um, sometimes it could be really difficult. Yeah, no, definitely. Communication is key. So as far as, you know, working with some of those endangered species, I know that, so how does, how does the AZA stud book work? Is that something that private keepers can be involved in? I actually don't really know anything about it besides, you know, the zoo side of it. Yeah. So, so each, 
So really they're moving away from stud books, which really just keep track of what animals are what and more towards the species survival plan, Mm -hmm. which gives you, you know, it works to get some genetic sampling done. It works to figure out um, and and let you know which animals should be paired with which animals and really manages the population more, which is really cool. Um, The AZA has been moving towards that, which is awesome. And it's been a real pleasure and and honor to be able to work in some of those programs. Um, It's getting more and more, it before the pandemic, um, the end of 2019 and into the beginning of this year, there were lots of ramblings and lots of work by the AZA to, to kind of legitimize their process with working with private folks. Mm. And it's, it's getting a lot more difficult to make that happen, which really number one, uh, on one hand, it's, it's, it's obviously really disappointing. On the other hand, it's, it makes sense because we made our bed and it's time for us to lie in it. If you look at the most, uh, the most public accounts of who we are, it's classified ads, it's people, you know, um, letting down another person who they had to deal with or whatever, or this or that and, and negativity and people disappearing with someone else's animals and yeah. all sorts of stuff like that with collaboration. And, and it really, it really, casts a bad light and and that sort of same sort of stuff has been happening with you know institutions like like aza institutions and and some of them are really difficult to work with so we are the only private group in the in the aza ssp for um spangler eye the Mm -hmm. vietnamese black-breasted leaf turtle there's 19 institutions and then us I'm really proud of that, but we're not going to be able to keep it going unless we can get like a letter of recommendation written by somebody who runs a zoo, the head of the zoo, and get somebody from that same institution to come and visit your place to give it the go ahead that it's okay, that that you're doing everything the right way. It's a lot now to be able to do that. And it's because people haven't taken it seriously. And it's nobody's fault but our own. And I own part of that too, even though I think I've been a a good SSP um, person who hasn't, you know, taken listed animals and sold them or whatever else. Um, only if anything have just worked to build our groups, but everyone hasn't necessarily been like that. And I think um, it's perfectly appropriate for me to say we messed up because we yeah. need to be better. Yeah. And show that we can be better. A lot of places don't think that private folks um, can collaborate on that level. And I don't, I don't, I know that that's not the case, but I think we have shown that it is the case. Yeah. It's understandable why they might think that. Yeah. So if, if for some reason you can't get that whole, you know, letter of recommendation, and everything, what happens to those animals? They just fall off the list and you keep them? Yeah, I don't know. Them? I don't know because it's never happened. I would I would keep them. They're my animals that right. I li- there are animals that we listed um, to try to build the um, to build the uh, bloodlines and, and the number of animals in, in the program. Um, but I think they would just be delisted. But that's it's never happened before. So I don't know what what that might end up looking like. I'm hoping that we can, as the pandemic, because the pandemic stopped everything. And we're talking about AZA institutions. They've been hit worse by the pandemic than anyone. So you haven't heard anything about it since it started. Mm. But um, yeah, I'm hoping that we'll be able to find a way to to survive it, make it work for us. But I see it as something that's going to make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to be involved in the future for private folks. Yeah, which is too bad. But yeah. so as, as far as breeding endangered species what are you doing with the offspring do those just you sell those to private keepers who are interested in that species or like you said there's i mean obviously the chances of having these animals get released into the wild is very slim so do those just go to private keepers so uh, my offspring in general the the, for the most part what i want to do is trade there are certain times where i have to do a three-way trade with somebody who has money because they want the animal I have and the animal I want, the person only wants money. They're the only person, when the only person in America who breeds a species says, I just want money, this is what it costs, then you need to have the money. So I'll say, I don't even want the money. You take this animal, you're going to do great with it and you can send the money over to this guy. And now I just traded for the animal I want. I really don't, I, I, I hate selling animals. I hate it. I do it. I have done it. And I do it once in a while. If there's a friend who asks me, Hey, do you have this available? Yeah. I might hatch one this year. If I do, we can talk and I'll, and then the money goes right back into, you know, acquiring another animal that's needed for a breeding project or, you know, um, supplies or enclosure stuff or whatever. But, um, for the most part, I'm just either keeping or trading what I'm producing and, and that, you know, some of that stuff might go to my partner's 
you know, we share animals around as well. So mm, gotcha. Yeah, it just yeah, depends. That, gotcha. So let's talk about your other podcast. We haven't, sure. we haven't mentioned it then. It's, it's a really, I'll just let you explain what it is and the title of it and everything. Then I have some questions. Oh, I love this. I love that you've listened to it too. He told me beforehand that he listened to it, everyone. And I was just, I'm blushing right now talking about <laughs> it. Um, so the podcast is called Turtley Devoted and it's an audio only podcast, um, which is available on lots of different um, platforms. Um, it's really cool. Uh, how that works and how we're able to figure that out. Cause I'm not the most tech savvy person. Um, There's so a learning cool curve there for sure. Yeah. 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 And it gets easier, but um, it definitely wasn't something that I w- it was easy for me to set up. Um, so uh, basically the idea for the show and we're eight episodes in right now, but the idea is basically that it's a show for my wife and I, Shannon, who has a biology degree and has a really good head on her shoulders um, just in general, but she's a lot different than I am. And that's what makes us a great team. But it also, I just think sometimes we have really funny conversations. She makes fun of me. I make fun of her. And we have these funny conversations about like what I'm doing. And, you know, she was taking, this isn't even on the podcast, but she was taking pictures of me when I was building my pond because she would see me just standing and staring into the pond like (laughs) all the time. Like it could be like a meme series. There's just a million photos of me um, that she has of me just staring at the pond because you stand there and you think, or you, or you admire, or you're looking for a specific animal that's out there or whatever. But, um, and the funny conversations that we have about that and everything. And, and as that stuff is happening, I'm just thinking, man, I'd love to just do one that can just be more laid back where it's just us talking and having a good time because the podcast has usually a lot of players. We have, you know, three hosts on somebody behind the scenes, working all the details out and everything while we're on that show. Um, and it feels more polished and more official. Um, we're doing it for the for the organization, that sort of thing. So this is just something that's a little more laid back where we can make fun of each other. You know, I can make fun of her for not having enough hobbies. She can make fun of me for being obsessed with, you know, my calling. Um, I won't call it a hobby. Um, but it's been, it's been pretty good so far. I think it's it's getting to the point where we need to start having some guests on because it gets a little like bickery. Um, a little uncomfortable at times, which is probably good. I think conflict probably sells and that's why reality TV is so popular. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a great show. I've listened to three episodes, so I got five more to go to catch up and it is funny too. I was actually laughing out loud and I am someone that is actually very difficult to make me laugh. So yeah, so I I was laughing at the the horse stories and whatnot from the anniversary or the, from the honeymoon, which was, Oh yeah, that was hilarious. So I'll definitely tell people to go put that in the show notes and everything, but but just as far as the dynamics of it go, because I think anybody who keeps animals, even at, at a smaller capacity, will totally relate to it because yeah. it, 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 especially if you have somebody who's your partner is not necessarily, you know, getting their hands dirty with the hobby or with the project as well. The, it is tough. There's yeah. this very, very tough pull when you're being drawn into your animal room and yeah. you have a family in the other room. Like it, yeah. it, it's something that we don't talk about enough, but it, yeah. if you don't, if you don't go th- down that path correctly, it would, it would just destroy everything. Totally. I was starting to. So it brought us together. She was trying to act like she was cool and like down for anything when we were like dating. And then, you know, you get married and things change a little bit and, and she kind of becomes herself a little more, which is a beautiful person, but different than what she showed me at first. We used to go (laughs) on hikes and flip over logs and go and catch turtles and go to this nature place and drive down the coat, like drive down to Florida and stop at all the reptile related things on the way. And like, I thought this was what my life was going to be, but it changes. (laughs) You have, you get dogs, you have kids, you own a house and things change and that's fine. And she's not doing anything wrong by that. But then also things change for me. We're like, now I'm getting, you know, I'm getting calls and emails and texts from people all over the world that just want to talk to me about whatever rare turtle species or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, hello, this is all I want to do. So I'm like, and she's sitting there like, what the hell? My husband doesn't love me anymore, which Mm -hmm. which is not the case. But for a while, it started to pull us apart a little bit as things were growing and progressing, where at the beginning, it used to really bring us together. And it was something we enjoyed. And she started to get um, to have some animosity. Um, We talked through it, we worked through it, which took time and work. It wasn't, you know, anything absolutely horrendous, but it, it took time and it took work. And, um, you know, we basically realized like, okay, if, if she's going to be happy, 
I need to have her involved. And she realized if, if I'm going to be happy, I need to be involved and let's figure out ways to make it happen. And she does, she does some stuff for the turtle room. Now she's super organized and thoughtful and creative and funny. And she just does really well with all that sort of stuff. And um, you know, the pod, the podcast is a great opportunity for us to just take it to the next level. And she's actually, every time we've recorded one, it's been her saying, Hey, do you want to record a podcast today? Which is cool. Cause I think a lot of people actually, I was talking to somebody about it and they said like, you know, I, I feel it, you know, that one sounded like you were like pulling her to do, to do the podcast or whatever, like forcing her to do it, which, which I can totally understand at certain times, but I think it's more my personality and and her taking a more laid back approach, not being as comfortable with the recording and everything. Um, but I also think that that's that person's own baggage coming into how they're listening to it because right. every one of us goes through it on some level. Yeah. So that's why I, th- I think it's kind of a cool idea. It is a very cool idea. And, and it, it is something that people probably need some advice on, or at least to hear other people going through it. Cause it, keeping animals, especially when you have many is not, it's not for the faint heart really, because you, it, it's hard to describe when you have one small problem in your animal room, it is so hard to get your mind off that problem when you're an animal person. Like that's right. all you can think about is, you know, you're watching a movie. It doesn't matter. You're thinking about why is that light not working or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And it is so important to, to be able to learn how to balance that because I can feel my, the gravitational pull of this room sucking me in. I could be in here forever yep. and never leave. And, and yep. if you don't catch yourself, it's bad. Right. That was me tonight, right? I've animals in the morning work, then animals at home, then the podcast, I still found time. I ate dinner with my family. I went and spent, I, I like laid on my daughter's bed with her while she was doing some ABC mouse and like I'm letting her, it's a new thing she's excited about. It's new for us and she's excited about it. So I let her show her like actually making a concerted effort to make the, to, to leave my phone downstairs mm-hmm. and spend my time with them because I can't spend the few free hours I have today texting somebody about a, uh, uh, hinge back tortoise in Southern Africa. I can't, I can't do that. South yeah. Africa. Yeah. Sorry, Bryce. <laughs> you, can get <laughs> like to him, you can get to him tomorrow. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Yeah. From Bryce. Yeah. It, he has the greatest accent in the world, Bryce. Right. Totally. I wish I had that South African accent. <laughs> totally. I know. I knew what you were I'm like. Okay. Dylan's yeah. got to figure it out. This is, yeah. this is working for me. The accent's good, but yeah. uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's very cool. Like it, uh, it's hard to describe that to somebody who doesn't have animals, they probably wouldn't understand it. So it is, it is such an important thing. And, and I think involving your significant other in it in some yeah. way is probably key. And that's what actually I'm trying to do a little bit with my wife as well. Cause she doesn't really have any involvement with any of this stuff. It's not that she hates it. Cause I think that would be horrible if you had yeah. a spouse that just like despise you because of it. She's just doesn't have that deep passion like I do. But if there's right. ways that you can get that person yes. involved to do small things Yes. that pull them in, it helps balance it. Absolutely. And f- figuring out what's important to them. Shannon loves, she loves organization. She wanted, she wanted me to, she wants me to sell animals or used to want me to sell animals and didn't understand why I didn't want to. Um, but she's given that up now because I just fight it like wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> I just won't do it. But, but she, um, you know, she, she realizes, um, that that wasn't going to work. And and it's unfortunate because I think with her organizational skills and attention to detail, she would have been a great support if that was something I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So then it's like back to the drawing board. And I think this really works, you know, you're planning for podcasts, um, thinking up ideas. Um, I think she has a nice voice too. She does. Yeah. That's why I married her. I like, yeah, (laughs) that's a good um, idea. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So it was something that ended up working and I never would have imagined three years ago that we would be doing this right now, but it's just kind of how things worked out. So it kind of fits the the mold of how the turtle room developed and, and everything else. Well, and there's so many just stories that are so relatable to people that have animals, you know, like you spilling water on the floor, things like that, where I, I can oh, totally yeah. see, like I've just destroyed our apartment so many times and just like got stains on the carpet. And my wife is so like, you know, she, she gets annoyed, but she lives with it. And it's just like, I'm not going to make a mess today. Like this will be a hundred percent. And then it's like, God, why is there paint on the floor now? Oh, so <laughs> you know, stuff like that. I've got one for you that came up on the podcast years ago, but hasn't come up in Turtly Devoted. But um, 
when I first got Spangler out years ago, my partner was driving up from down south and he, I'm like, listen, I'm really nervous. They have a reputation for being uh, um, really sensitive and dying on people. And I, can't, I just can't have this happen. I have to have this transition be as smooth as possible. He's like, no worries. What, whatever you want to do, let me know. I'm driving up so we won't have to even ship. Like, awesome. So I asked him to bring up their enclosures. No problem. So he brings up one of the enclosures because he could, couldn't fit both last minute. I'm like, all right, whatever. So he brings the enclosure. I, I bring it home and I set it down in my basement. Everything's the same, substrate, everything's perfect. Like exactly what this turtle knows. Awesome. And it was a pair of them. Um, as I set it down, I see a bug crawl out oh. of the enclosure. Yeah. Um, so I asked him about it and I swear, and, and this is how I remember it, but he said it was like some kind of beetle. I'm like, all right, it's a beetle, whatever, you know, where this is going. It's not a, it's not a beetle and it's not a dubia because I wish it was, <laughs> but it's a damn like Southern roach. I can't remember the exact species, but some sort of roach that isn't supposed to be living in Connecticut. <laughs> right. Like when, when there's roaches, it's like you have a nasty apartment up here, like a city apartment and, and like, they're like skinny and brown and this is like fat and black and I'm like, Oh God. It's like so the gross. ones from the movies. <laughs> I could not get these things out of my house. And when you have all these enclosures with water in them and stuff like that, like, how am I going to get my house bombed? I can't, yeah. I can't break down all the animals. They just live here now. And they did until we moved and I moved everything out. And I would think I would like dump everything at once, but not do the water enclosures because they're so difficult. Um, all the terrestrial enclosures because the, they would go and live in there. Um, but she didn't even know what it was. And, and I saw one one time, like, it's just a cricket. It's no big deal. Don't worry about <laughs> yeah. it. It's just a cricket. And then, um, I would tell my, my friend who was on the podcast one day when I had her on as a special guest host and he spilled the beans. He's like, how are those roaches doing? And I'm uh, like, are you kidding me? She doesn't even know about that yet. <laughs> oh, but that's uh, just one of those things that like, oh, we'll yeah. never forget it. It was such an important thing in our relationship and probably a huge setback and horrible. We can laugh at it now because I live in a different house. Yeah. <laughs> um, and those things died once I took the animals out. That's what was keeping them alive. They wouldn't have survived up here with no food, but I was feeding my animals a ton. Right. Uh, so they were getting, you know, all of that organic matter while they were down in that basement, but they never left the basement. It was, it really worked out perfectly, all things considered. But for like five years until we moved from that house, it was an issue. <laughs> anyway, the things yeah. we do for reptiles. Oh yeah, I had a similar experience years ago with uh, my day gecko enclosure had a garden millipede outbreak. It just had so many of these millipedes, and they just kept getting out, and they're all over. The, you just find them on the floor and the carpets. And at the time, my wife was just my girlfriend at the time, and she was really <laughs> starting to get mad. Like, right? And you think like I've, I've blocked all the holes. Like, don't worry. Like that one definitely <laughs> came from outside for sure. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, it, it just fell yeah. out of the enclosure again. Yeah. And right. And you're trying, <laughs> but that again, and that's what the podcast is about, right? That you're, you're, you have all of these, um, unintended obstacles that come up as like barriers between you mm -hmm. because it just comes up. It's like, Oh, uh, unneeded vet bill that now has to come out of our money to pay for some animal that you never wanted me to have in the beginning in, in the first place or an yeah. animal that gets shipped in when I told you that I wasn't going to get another one or, or whatever comes up or it's bugs in the house or a smell, a specific smell on a specific day, you know, that just causes this friction and, and being able to navigate that as a, as an acquired skill that we have to learn like a survival skill coping mechanism to get through um, and still work together with this person who you love and who you want to keep happy, but also who you want to be a part of everything. Because yeah. if I can't share it with her, then that's a big issue for me because it, this is my life. This is going to be my life no matter what. Um, and, and I don't want to have to choose because I would choose her. And that would be mean I would be just miserable forever. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. What about, what about your daughters? Do you think they'll be drawn into the turtles at all? Uh, my six-year-old thinks things are yucky, but she does like the baby turtles. Mm -hmm. um, and then my four-year-old is like my buddy. She doesn't care. When when it rains, she grabs her her rain boots and like, come on, daddy, we have to go outside and catch worms so we can feed the turtles. <laughs> like she's, awesome. she's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're both cool. They're amazing. They're amazing. But like I said, as amazing as they are, I wake up for the turtles. It's horrible as that is to say. Yeah. Just well, like any, life. any animal like person, calling. any animal person understands that it's just, yeah. it, it, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's, it just absorbs a different part of your brain. And partly it's these animals are, do rely on us. 
it's not like they can take care of themselves. So, and, and I think there's a bit of guilt from us about keeping them in captivity. Sure. Like every day I walk into the room, these are snakes that could be in the rainforest and they happen to be right. in Manitoba, Canada, where it's minus 40 below outside. So I, <laughs> there, there is, you know, some, a sense of me having to be there for them. Right. Absolutely. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I will definitely point people towards that podcast because it, it is it is so good. And as far as where you can be found online, what are some areas that people can find you or information about you? Yeah, so you could, uh, the turtleroom.org is our website. We have, uh, the turtle room is on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Um, so look for us there. Um, you can also look for me personally, just my name, Anthony Pierleone. That's P-I-E-R, like Pier One Imports. L-I-O-N, like the Lion King, I, Pier Leone. Um, so I'm on Instagram and uh, Facebook as well. And I'd love if you'd uh, check me out there. I, I share a lot of photos, but my Instagram is really new. So I don't have a lot of followers. So go follow them. If all you right, want well, to see turtle pictures, I promise I'll post good turtle pictures. That's exactly. all I can promise. I promise nothing more than that. <laughs> That's all we expect of you. Yes, nothing beyond that. Well, that is awesome. I'll make sure everything is in the show notes. And Anthony, thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. I think we got into some really interesting things that we haven't done on the show yet. So that was great. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Keep up the good work. I love your message, what you're doing. Um, is this episode 69 for you, by the way? <laughs> no, this is episode 70. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's right. Because you you recorded another one that I haven't heard yet. <laughs> that's right. It'll be out later ah, this week. I was going to yeah. say, because when we had M. Zodic on, who I first heard on your show, by the oh, way. Oh, interesting. Um, she was on episode 69. It was a huge joke that we said we weren't going <laughs> to say on air. And then I thought that I was for this one. Okay, yeah. forget it. You were so close. I And I'm so, so mature. That's what's important. <laughs> should, I, important should I label this? 69 plus one. <laughs> <laughs> no, make the last one 70 and me 69. It was okay. just out of order. That'll be less confusing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, that'll be less confusing for sure. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dylan. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. And that brings us to the end of another episode. Anthony, thank you very much for dropping in on an episode. And thank you so much for being a listener of the show as well. That really does mean a lot to me. I will make sure all links to Anthony's content is in the show notes, his Instagram, the both podcasts, that's the podcast and the Turtley Devoted podcast, as well as links to the Turtle Room. Listeners, thank you very much for tuning into this episode. Again, if you are interested in supporting, the best way you can do that is just share the content. Share it far and wide to your friends and your family on Facebook. That is the best way we can grow this audience. And the audience is growing, which has just been fantastic to see. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. If you're looking for high-end reptile equipment, I highly recommend going to check them out. Links are in the show notes as well as the YouTube description. And again, those are affiliate links. I will catch you guys in the next episode.